Well, welcome everybody. So glad that you are able to join us today. My name is Charles Watson Jr. and I'm Director of Education at BJC. And I am so honored to have two special guests with me today. First, uh, Dr. Sabrina Dent, a graduate of Virginia Tech University and also uh, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Divinity at Virginia Union University and a proud 2015 BJC Fellow. And also Reverend Keisha Patrick, who is a graduate of the University of Missouri undergrad and School of Law, as well as a graduate of Howard University School of Divinity and a proud 2019 uh, BJC Fellow. Ladies, welcome. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, Charles. Well, we get right into this. And we titled this program, uh, New Perspectives for Communities and Congregations, because of the book launch that uh, we all were a part of last week with your uh, new book, African Americans and Religious Freedom. And so Sabrina, if you could just give us a little background about uh, the book and how the project actually came about. Oh, sure, Charles. So thank you to the BJC and to you for inviting us to be a part of this conversation. Um, the book came about as um, a product, a tangible product for um, congregations and communities as a result of the Religious Freedom African American Perspectives project through the, um, the Religious Freedom Center of the Freedom Forum. Um, this is a project that was funded by the Henry Luce Foundation uh, that was part of um, a, a collaboration of scholars and academic partners and practitioners from the Afri African American community. And also specifically, it was a partnership among the six historically black theological institutions. And so one of the things that this project was intentional about was raising the perspectives of African Americans as it pertains to religious freedom in this country is not typically a part of of the mainstream narrative um, to hear uh, the experiences of African American people and um, the beautiful uh, the beautiful um, diversity that we bring to this conversation. And so I was excited to work alongside of um, scholars like Dr. Corey D.B. Walker, who um, is a senior fellow at the Freedom Forum um, and worked with us on this project and, and led us really to um, collaborating with some of the scholars that we had um that that we had with us on this journey so i mean there's so much that i could say but i'll save yeah. it for any questions that you have <laughs> to come up so well, i mean it, it was such a great thing to to network with the loose project and and this book coming about and also having the students from the historically black uh theological institution and, and that's actually how we uh met keisha uh yeah. through this through this program and, and, and keisha you and sabrina combined on the essay uh, in, in, in part of the book as the race advocacy and religious freedom. Right. Um, one of the themes for BJC this year is actually religious freedom white for too long. Mm -hmm. uh, Keisha, can you give us an example of, you know, where you've seen that be uh, a part of uh, the conversation, religious freedom being white too long, some examples of that? Well, I think one of the things is that religious freedom white too long is foundationally white too long, right? So it's that the concept of religious freedom introduced in the United States was introduced centering whiteness, centering Europeanism, centering Protestant Christianity as standard and norm, and then deciding what other practices of various races and ethnic groups were, could fit into the category of religion. So that's, that's a, just a foundational issue with how we've approached religious liberty. Uh, and I think one of the texts from the uh, class that I took was Tisa Wing Winger's Religious Freedom, The Contested History of an American Ideal. And she really explains how we got off to, the, to this foundationally um, unbal imbalanced start. But more practically, as we look at religious freedom today, white too long, we need prayer back in schools. White too long, issues of poverty, white too long, immigration, white too long, reproductive health. All of these things are influenced by a whiteness normalization of religious freedom. 
and what a whiteness, Europe, European centric, Western world centric uh, approach to religious freedom looks like. Wow, wow. So, so what I hear you guys saying, it, it grows me back to a, a narrative that uh, Dr. Corey Walker had, has talked about, you know, breaking and disrupting the narrative of, oh, this is uh, theology and this is the, and then anything added to that is that um, he, he talks about sometimes how um, people think we were brought over to this country that those of us that uh, were descendants of slaves were brought over to this country with a, a bare slate that we didn't have any religious thought. And then they just gave us religious thought. And so if they gave us religious thought, then we need to always come back to them for how uh, we think about and interpret these things. Exactly. And even worse in that they saw those who weren't practicing Protestant Christianity as they were as heathens. As he, yes. And so, I mean, and, <laughs> and then d defining for Native Americans, making them determine what was religious practice for them where for outside of Europe and Africans and Native Americans, our religious practices were a cosmos. They were a worldview and the Europeans have separated what's secular and what's sacred. And this, and, and when you put this in, you know, when you look at, the, look at it that way, then the Native Americans, for, them, for their religious practices, for their practices to be considered valid religious practices, they have to start separating their way of life to try and validate it to white America. Mm. <laughs> So much, so much I can say that, Keisha, and I know we'll come back to some, to some parts of that, but I, I will say what I've learned is that there was a we value in, in, in a lot of the narrative and religion that came from Africa. Um, not that Christianity wasn't in Africa, but therefore our form of Christianity and that was a we narrative and not a I side, but salvation yeah. narrative. And yeah. that makes a big difference when we, when we talk yeah. about theology. So I know both of you ladies, uh, uh, a, a part of Delta Sigma Theta, and I uh, I acknowledge that. Yes, <laughs> as, we as are. Put that out. And, but I also know it was a great day for the Divine Nine yesterday as we yes. saw our first Black, first South Asian, first female uh, VP, Kamala Harris, get uh, sworn in yesterday. And so with that, I wanted to know, Sabrina, if you could tell me um, how, how, how has it been difficult for uh, the, the black voice to come out uh, in congregations and communities. Uh, you know, she broke some glass ceilings yesterday. Could you talk about some of the ceilings that uh, you've had to break or still uh, ceilings that need to be glass ceilings that need to be broken um, in our communities and our congregations now? Right, Charles, that's a great question because unfortunately in 2021, there are many firsts that are still happening. And we witnessed one yesterday uh, with uh, the swearing in of Vice President Kamala Harris. I can't stop smiling when I say it. So, um, but as you said, there are many other firsts. So I think about in the world of religious freedom, first of all, um, to, to the point that you asked uh, Keisha, the question about um, being white too long, that's religious freedom has been white too long and it has been centered around a white male narrative about religious freedom. Now we're in a position now where many voices are being heard, more voices. So like Amanda Tyler, who leads the Baptist Joint Committee, but also, you know, you have Rachel Lasser, who is leading American United. But then I think about voices who have been in this space, but are not raised as much. So for example, Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook, she was the third ambassador at large for international religious freedom in this country. Um, if you know the history of her story, and she was also one of the contributors to this book, but if you know her story, she talks about how it took almost two years for her to be confirmed to that position and the challenges that she faced. Also, the reality is that sometimes she was the only woman that was in the room. But what concerns me even now is that a lot of times when you hear conversations about religious freedom, um, even international religious freedom, she's not often mentioned 
and and very rarely do people even know that she was the ambassador. Some people may know her as a religious leader um, that was in New York. They might know her as um, the former chaplain for the NYPD. Like um, they might know of those particular things. But as far as the work that she did and really breaking the glass ceiling and opening the door for us to be a part of this conversation. I mean, I think back to the work that I did at the Religious Freedom Center and how, you know, uh, I was introduced to Ambassador Sujay through uh, Dr. Corey Walker. He mentioned her name. I reached out to her and then we had a conversation and there was this kindred, this there was this kindred spirit that we had, but at the same time, not to mention the fact that she is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated as well. <laughs> I do have to put that out there that, you know, for her to see me and doing the work that I was doing at the Religious Freedom Center and say, okay, however I can support so when she was on a panel one time, I remember she acknowledged the work that was happening with this project. So there's still a lot of barriers that need to be broken. And also the way in which people understand religious freedom in this country, right? They speak of it through a very limited um, way in a very limited way and through a very narrow lens, not thinking about the, the issues that impact um, women of color in this country. So yeah, there are a lot of barriers that need to be broken. And so I'm fortunate to do this work because I was a BJC fellow and because someone at the BJC, Jennifer Hawks, then saw, you know, the potential to say, hey, go over to this organization. And then I had support in that space. So someone who's doing this work now, like me, I see it as my responsibility is to continue to make room at the table for other women of color who are doing this work or who want to engage in this work because there's plenty of space. And the reality of it is, is that because religious freedom impacts everyone in this country, religious and non-religious in so many different ways that we cannot afford to silence any voice on this. At the same time, we should not allow any person or any entity to say how we should enter into the conversation about religious freedom. So like for me personally, I bring all of my identities in this work. I bring my background and my experiences, someone that grew up in Petersburg, Virginia, that is central to my narrative and the work that I do on religious freedom. And then when I take into account the people that I'm friends with, the people that I've built relationship with, I have to bring them into the narrative as diverse as our, our identities may be. And I think that's important and, and how we have to continue to break this glass ceiling. Oh, not a dent. Not a dent. Yes. <laughs> yes to all of that. And, and, you know, I've worked with you. I've been honored to work with you closely and, and doing the, uh, you know, weave that identity wheel that really mm -hmm. people understand who they are and how many things uh, makes up a human being, not just their race. We're, we're talking about race and, you know, we may talk about sex, but maybe even just the uh, ability uh, to be a, able to use all of their functions in, in that way. Um, I have a military background. All of these perspectives uh, are brought to the table when we're talking about who we are as humans and what it means for religious freedom. And so Keisha, I wanna ask you with, with all of that being said, um, if we are not bringing, I'll just be direct with it. If we're not bringing black women to the table when it talks about religious freedom, what are we missing? And, 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 and what are the things or issues that uh, we maybe can't uh, really get a stronghold on or get a, a thorough thought process through because we have that voice missing uh, from, from the perspective. Wow, so, so much. Um, I'm gonna go back to the first question real quick and then hit this one. One mm -hmm. of the things that's right too long is the concept of what it means to gather as a religious community. Um, mm -hmm. And we are seeing that threatened during COVID and we're seeing many we're seeing whiteness impact our ability to secure public health. Um, and what religious standards, whose religious standards, whose religious freedom is censored in making sure that public health is protected. And that too is a black women's issue um, because we are disproportionately impacted during this pandemic. Right. 
So I just wanted to say that even gathering, gathering for some people is we got to assemble to have worship. And then they're there. But white too long does not consider this. Sometimes I gather and it's uh, and I'm in danger because of the Dylan roofs of the world. Mm. It's, it's, it's looked at wrongly. So but that's the first question. Your question now, <laughs> other ways that black women voices need to be heard is for one reproductive health. OK. So the religious right tells us that above any and every other issue, we must preserve the life of the unborn. We must, if you, if you are a real Christian, you are pro-life. <laughs> and that means, you know, restricting access to contraceptives, restricting access to abortion, um, all kinds of things supposedly to protect the innocent unborn. But what is not captured in that discussion, which makes, which proves to me that it's a farce, is that America has the highest rate of infant and maternal mortality in the developed world, period. On top of that, black women ha have a maternal mortality rate that's three times higher than white women and black infants have a mortality rate that's 2.3 times higher than white babies. If we care so much about the unborn, we would be centering these health issues. We would be trying to protect them. So reproductive health would have to be looked at differently as a religious freedom issue if black women's voices were brought to the table. Um, Again, COVID and other health concerns, food security and poverty, okay? Um, the fact that in our neighborhoods, you know, and from a Christian perspective, my Bible tells me, you know, to feed, feed the hungry, clothe, you know, those who are unclothed. And some religious freedom people were concerned about giving these people handouts. <laughs> but look at it from... But looking at it from the lens of a black mother trying to feed her children during COVID while also having to go work at a grocery store and feed everybody else. Mm. Mm. So th those are ways that our voices and, and work at a grocery store and feed everybody else after some people insisted they had to go to church that morning. Right. <laughs> and, right. So... So, I mean, these are ways that our voices need to be at the table so that because religious freedom issues pour into, as, as uh, Sabrina said, every area of our lives. Most definitely. My, wow. <laughs> um, I, I almost want to just say, hey, Sabrina, you got anything else to, to add to that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> so many. I say that, it, I say it smilingly, but I say that because I don't think people realize how many uh, ways that religious freedom touches our everyday lives. You know, people just think about, oh, I get to uh, worship how I want to worship or believe how I want to believe. Yeah, that, that's a part of the religious freedom, but it's not, it's not all encompassed in that. You know, it, it's, it, it touches so many different variants of that. And so we also, uh, and I've worked with both of you and you know BJC, it's not just people that have faith traditions that we're trying to protect and, and reach out to and, and gather with and do these things. It's people that don't have a faith tradition that are still human beings that have every right to a religious freedom or a religion, uh, freedom from religion that, that we uh, enjoy. And so uh, Sabrina, I, if you will talk about some of the, the work that you've, and I hate to bring it on you like this, but talk about some of the work you've done with you know, inner faith or, or non-believers in, in, in the black community and, and how trying to get them to understand um, this is important for us because it's a part of our entire freedom as a human being here in the United States. 
Right. Charles, um, one of the things that I think back to is in 2000, I actually met you in 2014, but when I met you, I was with the Interfaith Council of Greater Richmond. And I said during your presentation, I was like, if I'm working with the interfaith community, they need to know about religious freedom in a more comprehensive way. And so, um, and so in the work that I've done, I've been very intentional about bringing this topic to the forefront and when I, uh, of um, religious minorities as well, um, because their voices need to be raised, but also non-religious people. So um, in the work that we did at the Freedom Forum um, on this project, on African-American perspectives, one of the things I was very mindful of is every time we offered the class or we did a public program, I thought about whose voice was missing from the table, like whose voice was missing from the conversation. And so um, we we were fortunate to have our friends from the Baha'is of the United States, um, PJ and May were a part of our conversation that first year um, on our panel. We had our friend Rama Abdulalim um, from Karama, who was a part of the conversation. So again, it, it allowed the students, and when I say students, we're talking about adult learners, um, to connect with people who were from different religious communities because some of them had not. Most of them that were a part of the class identified as Christian. But that second round, by the time we did our public symposium, um, Disrupt the Narrative, um, that we invited Mandisa Thomas with Black Nonbelievers, who is, um, she's the president and founder of, non -black, um, of Black Nonbelievers to be a part of the conversation. Because as we, as, as we pointed out in this book is that African-American people are not not a monolith like we are we are from so many different backgrounds and belief systems that have different ideologies and so if we're talking about African Americans we need to bring all African Americans into this and so the work of black non-believers I've been fortunate to um, become a huge ally and friend of that organization and also um, Mandisa and Ro who's with their DC affiliate office who um, participated in our class um, the second time around around when we offered the second cohort, uh, we had a panel discussion to include a Baha'i, a Muslim, um, also to include a Black Catholic, and yep. to have a non-believer, right? Again, people need to understand the many different perspectives that people bring into these conversations. And, and with that, I, I, I want to just say this. I want people to stop looking at Black people and believing that all Black people are Christian. Like I need them to realize and to, to, that we're, we're, there's so many differences that we have and the diversity is beautiful, but ask the questions. Mm -hmm. ask, ask the questions, but get to know the person to ask them, like, tell me more about yourself, your beliefs, um, what have you, however they choose to frame the question in the most respectful way, because um, again, a dialogue <laughs> is about understanding, right, you, <laughs> so, and it's not, and it's not that, that person's job to try to convert anybody. Let the person be who they are. Um, and so one of the things that I celebrate about um, the relationship that we've built with Black non-believers, and I just celebrated their 10th anniversary with them this past weekend by being one of the speakers, that I counted it an, an honor to be considered a trusted voice that Mandisa would bring me into the community to talk about the work that I do on religious freedom. And so again, those issues that Keisha brought up when you're talking about reproductive health, reproductive justice, affordable health care, all of that, that impacts the religious and the non-religious communities. So yeah, so black women, no matter how they identify need to be centered in this conversation. And I might add to that education Yes. Because dependent, everyone's experience is different. Um, as, as a Black single mom, um, I have a 12-year-old son, and I'm very fortunate right now to have my son in Arlington Public Schools. Um, that is from where I sit right now, but I know from where I came. I'm from Petersburg, Virginia, and, and Arlington Public Schools are the second highest school district in the state of Virginia, where Petersburg Public Schools are not. So what does it look like when there's a commitment to 
to making sure that public funds, taxpayer money goes towards public education, especially in areas where they don't have the budget sometimes to support students to have adequate books or adequate resources such as laptops or other things that are needed. Or even if we wanna talk about the infrastructure that is needed for them to have access to the internet, there are layers of things that people need to think about when we're talking about religious freedom. So it's not just what you believe. For me, at the end of the day, this is also an issue of life and death for some people. And so I need people to see this more expansively than how they know it. Yes, yes. And so, so very well. So uh, we, we have a couple of minutes left here. Uh, it's three things I want to do. Uh, Keisha, I want to give you an opportunity to, you know, uh, not only are you a reverend, you are a, an attorney. Uh, and as you, as everybody looks at this book and gets a chance to uh, read this book, you, you bring up a couple of court cases, uh, the, the Ray case uh, down in Alabama, where we, where we have the um, um, African-American who was a uh, Muslim and wasn't able to actually have his uh, faith leader with him before his execution down there. Um, if you can give me just a, a little a bit of about uh, even being in, in, in the attorney space uh, and understanding, you know, the re religious freedom and some of the injustices that you see that, that kind of touch in those, those realms as well. So this is not my area of practice. I just want to clarify right. that. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, because I'm an attorney, I see things, I can't take that lens off, right? Um, yeah. And just, to, uh, just stepping back real quick, I took a religious liberties course in law school um, mm -hmm. that was uh, taught by one of the architects of Faith-Based Initiative. Um, and taking the African-Americans and religious freedom course was totally different. And so mm -hmm. some, of the, some of it is looking at this constitutional structure that was set by whiteness, set by European standards of what religion is set by Protestant Christianity and then applying that to every religious issue. And I see that we definitely have a problem when a man, when a man cannot have his religious, his faith leader present, but they can make a Christian chaplain present. Mm -hmm. That's injustice. It just right. is. I just don't even know how you can see it any other way. Um, yeah. And, and, and so it's hard for me, it, so I'm, when I'm looking at this stuff, I'm looking through, through my lens of my legal education and knowledge and skills, as well as through my lens as a clergy person and a person who cares about humanity, believes that as a Christian, believes that each human being has been made in the Imago Dei, in the image of God. Um, and, and so that's... I, I hope that that answers yeah. your questions. But yeah, Keisha, yeah. you answered it perfectly because what it shows is how uh, detrimental to the conversation it is to leave out somebody like you, Dr. Dent, like you, Reverend Patrick, that have so many different identities and so many different lenses that you can look at a situation where if you're only going to let it be white and you're not going to see every lens. Um, there's a white lens too. And so all of the perspectives are needed in order to get to the place where we actually have religious freedom for everybody here in the United States. And, and not even just here in the United States, I think religious freedom is, is a worldwide issue and we have to have another conversation about that. But um, for those who are watching us, I want you to uh, be able to, to get this book and we're gonna drop the link for this book in, in um, the, the chat or in the uh, Facebook comments there. So please go out and get this. Uh, it's just one step toward, uh, you know, religious freedom not being white for too long being white too long and it's also one of the first steps that we're taking at bjc i want you to join us next month as we celebrate black history month with a series called voices of black faith freedom every thursday next month at 1 30 we're going to have a special guest or two uh join us to talk about uh religious freedom in the black context and our first guest is the reverend william lamar the fourth uh, the Metropolitan a &E, uh Church here in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, you may remember him because uh, the Proud Boys were uh, part of the group that tore down the sign at his church. Um, and so it, it vandalized the things at his church. So we have him 
answering the question for us uh, on February the 4th at 1.30, what can America learn about faith freedom from the black church? So thank you again, Dr. Dent. Thank you, Reverend Patrick, for joining us today. Thank you for be, being BJC fellows and uh, just being friends uh, to, to me and to the BJC. Thanks for having us, Charles. Yes, thank you. you. We yeah. appreciate it. All right, bye-bye.